Crazy Eddie is such an appropriate name here. I don't think that I've seen a case quite like this one, so I sat down and tried to come up with some good words to describe it. Some of the more fitting ones were deceptive, brilliant, concerning, even scary, but crazy just really captures the overall feeling of it. There were so many layers of fraud happening here that it's almost hard to believe. I'll get more into the details about it, but essentially the entire business was a fraud for almost 20 years. See, Crazy Eddie was the name of a chain of electronic stores that grew amazingly popular in the New York area in the 1980s. Today, the most comparable store that we all know would be Best Buy. It was like a high energy, zany version of Best Buy. Around their peak in 1988, Crazy Eddie was the sixth largest chain of electronic stores in the country, controlling almost 4% of the market. And at the rate they were going, many believed that they would soon be making their way toward the top of that leaderboard. The year before that, they reported over $350 million in sales, which was six times larger than they had reported at the start of that decade. They had grown to about 40 locations, mostly in New York, but now expanding as far south as Philadelphia. But you know what? I think the name recognition was far greater than it should have been for a company of this size. Practically anyone living anywhere near New York knew the name Crazy Eddie because for over a decade, they ran an amazingly effective ad campaign. Here, it only takes a few seconds for you to get the idea. Idea. Even an audio video component system get it all on sale now during Crazy Eddie's greatest TV and video sale ever. Yeah, that's the thing. Crazy Eddie was so crazy that his prices were insane. Uh, I almost hate to say it, but I've spent way too much time looking back at these, and from everything I've seen anyway, they are all very similar. They're all loud and gimmicky and low budget, but somehow strangely compelling. By the end, they had produced over 7,000 of these ads, aired on both television and on radio, so that would account for their incredible name recognition at the time. I would bet that most people watching this have seen something in pop culture that was at least influenced by one of these commercials. It just seems to come up every now and then. For example, the first one that comes to my mind would be Malfunctioning Eddie from Futurama, a character obviously based on it. Now, I want to make this clear because it's easy to make the mistake. The person you see in the commercials is not Crazy Eddie himself. That was a local DJ named Jerry Carroll that was hired to be in those commercials, uninvolved with the fraud in the rest of the company. This right here is Crazy Eddie. His actual name is Eddie Antar, and the company was run by the Antar family. It was started by Eddie, his father, and a cousin in 1969 as one small electronic store in Brooklyn named Sights and Sounds. Over the next few years, they changed the name and the ownership structure a bit, but most of the higher-up positions were always filled by members of the family, meaning that they were the ones committing the crimes, essentially from the beginning. All of this sounds so bad, but there were two distinct eras of fraud occurring, one throughout the 1970s and one throughout the 1980s. Oddly enough, the two were practically opposite, so let me start with the 1970s. During that time, Crazy Eddie was a small private company with one location to start the decade and only seven by the end of it. Given those circumstances, their main motivation for the fraud was simply to evade taxes. The Antar family wanted to keep the money that they earned rather than giving it to the government, and since a business is taxed on their profits, their real goal here was to illegally make their profits appear to be lower than they actually were. And their primary method of doing that is pretty basic. It's called skimming. Remember, this was the 1970s, so many of their customers were paying with cash, and at the end of the day, they should be depositing that cash into the bank, adding it to their accounting records, and then at the end of the year, use all of that to determine their taxable income. Well, it turns out, if you just take that cash and spend it, or store it in your mattress at home, it never gets recorded, and you're never asked to pay taxes on it. Which is very illegal because the law says that anyone who gets paid in cash legally has to report it and pay taxes on that money. Over at Crazy Eddie, it got to a point where they were taking millions of dollars from those cash sales and hiding it all over their houses, like Walter White, and they even opened multiple bank accounts in foreign countries. It was later found that one of these accounts in Israel had over six million dollars in it. They would use some of that money to pay their employees and just keep everything off the books to make it appear that they were smaller than they actually were and therefore 
poor would be asked to pay lower taxes. An effect of this is since they were saving money on taxes, they now had extra money that allowed them to sell their electronics at lower prices, like they said in their commercials. We are not undersold, we will not be undersold, we cannot be undersold, and we mean it! They had this price match guarantee where they would match the price of any competitor and even refund your money if you found the item cheaper somewhere else within the next 30 days. They were gaining an unfair advantage, considering that they were evading taxes that all of their competitors were forced to pay. And there was more happening at the time, involving insurance and warranties, they were finding shady suppliers to avoid fair trade laws that were still in place, allowing them to illegally lower their prices, but skimming was the biggest way that they were fraudulently making money. But as I said, in the 1980s, all of it changed, when they decided that instead of scamming the government, it would be more profitable to scam investors. See, they were looking to become a public company, which did happen in 1984. For them, that meant selling partial ownership of Crazy Eddie to whoever wanted to buy it on the stock market, while Eddie and the rest of the Antar family would retain ownership of more than half of it. The plan here was to do whatever they could to artificially make that stock price go up, which would increase the value of the shares that they owned, and then they would sell those shares at that inflated value. Which is exactly what happened. Within two years of their IPO, Crazy Eddie shares were trading at a 10 times higher value. Along the way, the family sold most of their shares at those inflated values, pocketing almost $100 million from it. When deciding which stock to buy, investors tend to rely heavily on earnings reports. They want to see healthy financial statements and high earnings. So oddly enough, their goal in all of this was the exact opposite from what it was before. Now, they wanted to make their profits seem higher than they actually were, so investors would buy their stock. This right here is why I used the word brilliant earlier, because believe it or not, they started committing a fraud by committing less fraud. I know, it doesn't make sense, so let me explain. Back in 1980, when they were still concerned with lowering their profits, they had skimmed $3 million of unreported revenue. Just consider that taking $3 million right off the books and storing it in a bank in Israel. Then, in 1981, the next year, they wanted their profits to start growing, so they did it by skimming a little less than $3 million, and by 1983, they were hardly skimming at all. They weren't actually making more money, but because they weren't taking as much away, it appeared that they were making more money. It makes sense, right? They were committing a new fraud by not committing the old fraud. Then, a little later, they started funneling some of the money that they had already taken back in to continue raising those profits. And then, just to go through some of the other ways that they illegally raised their reported profits, fake sales. They created all of these fake invoices and then told everyone that the sales were made, we can go ahead and book them into the sales figures, we just don't have the money to show for it because they haven't paid us yet. That made their revenue go up. Another pretty clever way was overstating their inventory. Each year, out of nowhere, they would just add millions of dollars to their inventory balance. Then when the auditors would ask to, you know, see that inventory, they would either borrow it from their suppliers who agreed to it because they were reliant on their business, or simply ship their inventory between locations, so it would be counted multiple times. They would stack it in tricky ways to make it appear that there's more there, and in the end, they successfully reported far more inventory than they actually had. Timing differences was another big one. When it came to reporting sales, they would include some of the ones that came in past the end of the fiscal year. You know, saying that a VCR that they sold in early 1987 was actually sold in late 1986, inflating those 1986 sales. And how about inflating comparable store sales? If you watch this channel, Channel, you have seen me talk about comparable store sales, comparing the sales of each store to the year before. I talk about it because it's a good measure of success, and commonly factors into an investor's decision of whether or not they want to buy a company's stock. In this case, they had a strong relationship with the makers of the electronics, so they were able to make extra money by buying them at low discounted prices and selling them to other retailers, effectively acting as a wholesaler. But then, they would take those sales and report them as retail sales at their store location. They were intentionally being misclassified to inflate their same store sales figure. Now, at this point, it's safe to say that the financial statements put out by Crazy Eddie were not even close to representing the actual business. Investors were out there looking at these statements, trusting them to be accurate, and buying their stock based on it. So a big question here would be, what about the auditors that reviewed all these statements and said that they looked accurate? Why didn't they catch any of this? And for that, I would look toward Eddie's cousin, Sam Antar, chief financial 
financial officer of Crazy Eddie and pretty much the mastermind behind all of this fraud. Some of these statements sound so bad, but the company literally sent him to college and paid for his tuition so he can go there and learn how to commit a more complex fraud. Upon graduation, he passed the CPA exam, a very difficult test, and started working at the auditing firm that audited Crazy Eddie's at the time. Obviously, that's a massive conflict of interest, so Crazy Eddie's then started paying him off the books so the firm wouldn't learn about it. During his time there, Sam learned all about how the audits are conducted. He learned effective ways to commit the fraud and then how to go about tricking the auditors. In 1984, when the company went public, Sam quit that firm and went back to Crazy Eddie's as the CFO where he would work to commit and cover up the fraud. He says that he would intentionally distract the auditors to waste their time and force them to rush through parts of the audit. They would hire the auditors for consulting work as well. The added business would potentially give them reason to look the other way. Their own employees were instructed to lie about the inventory counts and even manually obtain the auditor's work papers and change some of the numbers on them. Sam Antart is a smart person and from my point of view is the main reason that they were able to pull this off for as long as they did. Well, in the late 1980s, everything started to go bad at Crazy Eddie's. Prices of electronics were rising, the competition was more intense right when they were in the middle of an overly aggressive expansion plan. That combination helped cause the stock price to go down. The shareholders were then able to successfully take over the company and as the new owners with access to everything, it obviously didn't take long for them to figure out what was happening and they went bankrupt soon after. From there, Sam was very cooperative. He came out about everything, pled guilty, testified against Eddie, and only received minor penalties. And you turned around and yes. turned on your family. Yes, I put them all in jail. He was on house arrest for a few months and lost his CPA license, but for Eddie, of course, things were much crazier. I stayed there and I took the heat. You ran. You ran like a coward. He fled to Israel for a couple of years where he was then captured and extradited to the United States. At the end of his trial, he was sentenced to 12 and a half years in prison. Then, the judge was found to be biased during the trial, so the conviction was overturned. But instead of a retrial, he took the opportunity to plead guilty in exchange for an eight year prison sentence. He then spent some more time in prison before being released in 1999. And as if all of that wasn't crazy, Crazy enough, maybe the boldest part of any of this is in 2001, he attempted to bring the business back with similar advertising, but this time as an internet company without any physical locations. It obviously didn't work, and to finish the story of Crazy Eddie, he died in 2016 at the age of 68. Let me know in the comments, what do you think of Crazy Eddie? To me, this seems like one of the more dangerous cases of fraud, because everything about it, on the outside anyway, seems so fun and friendly. I'll admit that if I were living in New York in the 1980s and of course didn't know about everything that was going on behind the scenes, I'll bet that I would have loved this place. I am glad that I didn't have the opportunity to invest in Crazy Eddie because it would have been tempting. They were able to recover over $100 million from various bank accounts and distribute it to the investors that were fooled, but it's still scary to think about. Speaking of scary, I want to ask, now that I've talked about it, would you agree with my list of words here or do you have one that seems to fit better? And any other thoughts? you have about Crazy Eddie, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.